Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is a Noise XT 2 MHz with 7 GHz clock synthesizer. It's basically just an LO signal generator for very low phase noise applications. It can be a clock, let's say, for a multiplier that goes into an analog to digital converter. It can be a reference for a very sensitive transmitter or receiver. And it's, you know, 7 GHz is still a fairly high frequency. It's very uh, small form factor. It's controlled with a USB, and there's a fan in the back, and there's an apparently an SPI interface, which I guess you can program to rapidly change the frequencies and so on. Reference can be input, and it can support two channels. It only has one, of course, and this apparently was working uh, until it fell off the table. Evidently, it was connected, and it fell off the table, and it doesn't work anymore, so it's now worthwhile taking a look at. I'm a little bit reluctant turning it on, given that it has uh, fallen off the table, so if there's something wrong with it, indeed, it's going to probably make it worse. It looks really nice and compact, so let's go ahead and take it apart and see what it looks like on the inside, and then see if we can do some testing with it before we completely disassemble it. So I was trying to get ready to test this, and I went to their website to download the software to control it, because as I said, it does have a USB interface in the back, and the software is not on their website. Yeah, you, you cannot download the software. You have to ask them for the software to be sent to you. And I tried that, and unfortunately, their factory is closed until the middle of August. That is really not good business practice. There's no reason why the software that comes with your hardware is not downloadable from your website directly. It's just holding the instrument hostage, especially in situations like this when their factory is closed and you can't even get the software. Anyway, it took a long time by asking a lot of people to finally find an old version of the GUI that controls this for Windows XP. I'm going to have to run it in emulation mode probably to get at least to be able to communicate with it. So yeah, it was a very frustrating experience. Definitely not something that I encourage manufacturers to do. Anyway, let's go back to what we're doing. So taking this apart is pretty straightforward, but I did notice something. If you look over here, you can see that the metal in front of the chassis is tucked behind these blue spacers, but in the front, it's not. It's sticking out, which means that this has already been opened, and that worries me because in the description, it said that it was never opened and that repair was not attempted. I'm going to be a bit more careful here. Obviously, there's a fan connected. And, uh, oh, aha, look at that. The fan is not connected. Oh, no, actually, you know what? the connector is totally broken off. So that's the first problem. That is not a good thing. So we're going to have to see if we can put this connector somehow back. That is unfortunate. Yeah, I can see the end of the connector there. So we can continue disassembling this and hopefully everything should come apart. And here's the module inside. It looks nice. This is obviously the RF deck, but it is made up of two PCBs. And the back PCB over here has, seems to have all the voltage regulators as well as the PIC microcontroller, which is clearly connected to the USB as well. So the interface is handled by this nice mechanical switch here. We can, we can turn it on and off, of course. And a bunch of DCC converter inductors I see as well. Yeah, nothing unusual here. No, no, not the RF and the analog stuff is actually connected to this power supply input here as well. I do have the power supply, luckily, but I'm sure this can work with a wide range of power supplies. Looks good. I think we should take it apart a little bit more so we can see what's in between. I do see some barge wires here, and I do see the oven-controlled crystal oscillator spot here that is not populated, and <laughs> I'm sure it didn't fall out because it's not in the box. I think it's just simply uh, this one doesn't have that option. All right, onto the ESD mat, and let's go ahead and remove this carefully, and let me see, disconnect this. There we go. And yeah, look at that. Wow, there's a lot of corrections on this board. That's a bit surprising. So here's how this board connects to this one. We have this connector over here that obviously mates to each other. But interestingly enough, on the other side of this, there is exactly the same connector mounted. So it's like a bus that you can drop on one of these channels. So clearly, they've intended this to have the two channels controlled by the same controller in the front and by this one, which makes sense. That reduces the cost significantly. You can stack them. I wonder how many of these you can support on one of those controllers. Yeah, so it does have a lot of corrections. You can see wires running around, and wow, there are even components tacked on. That's a lot of work. I'm surprised that this is even economical at this point to do in factory. Look at that. That looks like a footprint was backwards, and they kind of redid it afterwards. Yeah, looks like a huge amount of labor. You can see components added over here, components added all the way down here. Yeah, there's a lot of changes. These things take a long time, of course, to do, but I guess they really had to make this and get it out of the factory. So they decided to put the effort. Unfortunately, with these corrections, things can become a lot more difficult to fix because some of those things can just come off. They're more susceptible to mechanical noise. Now, this is, this is 2014, so this has been a long time. I'm sure that they have improved this product since then, and the later revisions probably has all these corrections built into it. 
I'm just surprised that this was, uh, you know, it made any sense to do this much work on it. So our test setup is really simple. We're just going to connect it directly here. I'm going to use the MSO6 series here because it has 8 gigahertz of bandwidth, and we can use Spectrum View to see what happens to the frequency and if there is any glitches or any problems should be easy to find. You can, of course, also use a Spectrum Analyzer, which is fine. There we go. So I've also connected it here to the PC. Let's go and take a look at the GUI, turn it on and see what happens. Actually, I can turn it on. Let me see. There we go. If I turn it on, there should be a light. There it is. The light does come on, so it's doing something. Okay, that looks good. Okay, let's go and take a look at this software. I've already set it to Windows XP emulation. That's why it's asking for this. And yeah, looks okay. Nothing unusual. It starts with RF on, which is a bit weird. Normally, you should not turn the instrument on when you power it on. And this is just a, a sample GUI. You can, of course, write your own drivers. You can write your own software controller with LAPI or MATLAB, whatever you want to be. But it seems like it is communicating with the instrument. It's a 10 dBm is a good amount of power, 1 gigahertz. Okay, let's go and take a look and see what uh, shows up on the screen. This thing is really, really hot, almost too hot to touch. I wonder if that's normal. Obviously, there's no fan across it. So that is getting me a little bit worried. And of course, there is absolutely nothing. Yep, nothing at all comes out of it at 1 gigahertz. It could be that maybe the signal is really, really weak. So we can go ahead and try and look at it in spectrum view and see if we see anything at all. So here, looking at a 5 millivolt per division, we can indeed see that there is a 1 gigahertz signal. I can, in fact, turn it on and off. There it is. You can see that. And it's at minus 42 dBm or so. I'm going to try and see if I can move the frequency. Let's say we go from 1 gigahertz to 1.5 gigahertz. Does it move? There it is, it does move. And it became a little bit larger in amplitude. That looks good. So I think maybe we can sweep this around a little bit and see where the frequencies are present, if there is any discontinuity, and, it's, and if there is a frequency where the power works. And that tells us something about the nature of the device itself. And I think it might make sense to connect it to a spectrum analyzer. That way we can record the screen a little bit easier. Okay, so here is our new setup. I have the connected the output of the synthesizer directly to the SM200C and that is connected with a fiber directly onto a 10 gigabit Ethernet on the computer. Sorry for the mess. And of course, all these instruments I have full reviews and teardowns of so you can take a look. Let's go to the computer now we can look at the full spectrum. So here's the interface for our SM200. This is the spike software from SignalHound and right now there is nothing. Let's go ahead and turn this on. And what do we get here? There it is. It's exactly what we saw on the Tektronix MSO6. We have indeed a power of about minus 38 dBm, which was about the same as we saw before. The cable is a little bit different in this case. Let's go into higher frequency. Let's try 1.5 gigahertz here. What do we see? Yes, indeed, we do see higher. Now it's minus 32 dBm. That's unusual. That's unusual. Let's go to 2 gigahertz. Okay, it's a little bit more. Let's go to 3 gigahertz. It's more again. This is very interesting. Let me go ahead and put this onto max hold here. And let's go ahead and start once again at 1 gigahertz. So here's a 1 gigahertz signal. Let's try 2 gigahertz. Yes, in fact, it is going up and up. Here's 4 gigahertz. And let's try 5. And then, oh, that's unusual. Let's go ahead 6. And let's try the highest, which is 7. Yes, it is going continuously up. There's a ripple here. But I think I'm beginning to see what's going on here. So let me try 0.5, it should be here. And okay, if I try really low, it should be very, very small if I'm right about this. Yeah, there it is. So if you look at this, you can see it does have a trend of getting higher and higher. Now, we've seen problems like this before. This could be a bad trace or a broken connector because essentially what happens is that because the distances are so small, you're AC coupled. So the capacitor becomes smaller and smaller impedance at higher frequencies, allowing the RF signal to travel through. Now, of course, the impedance is not well matched, and this could be one of the reasons why there's a dip here. You could have even a bigger dip if you have a, a complete resonance at some point. But indeed, it seems to be going higher and higher at higher frequencies. And this is consistent with the fall of the broken trace, like I said, or maybe a bad capacitor. This is now worthwhile opening and taking a look at it and see if you can identify what could be the problem. Of course, there are many other things that could be wrong. We have to look at the architecture of the synthesizer, but this is promising, at least based on what we see, that there is a signal, it is tracking, it's very, very stable, and there's nothing else seems to be wrong with it. It's just that the power is not getting to the output and it does go up higher frequencies. So let's go take it apart. 
Okay, let's take a look and see what's underneath here. So this, you can see there's a few thermal pads that have come off, and all that heat is coming from very few components. I'm curious what those are. We can take a look underneath, and there it is. This is a nice board, a lot of mixed signal engineering, obviously, and a lot of extra work again for some corrections here. This is incredible that this even works uh, the way it is. Anyway, let's go ahead and see, you know, do some reverse engineering and see how this thing works. This is our 100 megahertz main crystal. This crystal is essentially the, the heart of the entire synthesizer that sets the reference. And it's obvious that this is being fed from here, but we have some signals that can be overwritten and influenced by the external reference. So that's how you can potentially tune this into a precise external reference. And if there is an oven controlled crystal oscillator, it would also be part of this section. There is an interesting switch here. Perhaps that's how they dial in whether the OCSO is there or not. After this, we can follow the signal. So we have 100 megahertz here goes through a doubler, becomes 200, and it's amplified and filtered, doubled again, becomes 400, goes through a saw filter, amplified, split into two, some of it couples this way, or perhaps some signal coming this way, I'm not quite sure because it's such a mess over here, but either way we don't really need to worry about this section. The 400 megahertz signal comes over here, gets doubled again, becomes 800 megahertz, saw filter, amplified, split into two sections, filtered again, so they really, really want to make sure that the signal coming out of here is a extremely clean 800 megahertz single tone and that's because that is used as the reference for these two direct digital synthesis analog devices parts these are one gigasample per second 14-bit DAX basically running obviously at 800 megahertz in this case and there is a single entity differential conversion to produce a differential clock signal for both of these so these are running independently which means that you can synthesize two extremely low phase noise signals up to a couple of hundred megahertz using these two separate from each other and therefore you can mix them with each other and produce other frequencies that you need. And then it goes into two transformers, differential to single at conversion, amplification, filtering once again, going through here. And this one and this one both come through and they meet here at this mixer. And this mixer will then be able to combine these. So now because you have two independent LO and IF signals, you can produce a wide range of RF signals with extremely high precision because you can tune these uh, independently and therefore meet any frequency you want. So this now becomes a really strong PLR reference, a very uh, flexible PLR reference, which comes into this device, which is an analog device's uh, phase detector, which is, the, again, part of another PLR. And that needs two signals, of course. It needs the reference, and it needs the signal from the VCO. And that, that comes from this ZCOM VCO here, which operates between, four, between 2 to 4 gigahertz. So this 2 to 4 gigahertz signal comes over here, gets divided with a programmable divider to put it within the frequency range of the phase detector, and then these two meet here together. And the phase detector then can adjust the VCO in order to lock this PLL. So this PLL path is pretty interesting, going all the way over here, then mixing over here with, the, with this mixer, and then locking this, ultimately this VCO to this. So now that you lock it to this, you can influence the output of this VCO with very good phase noise using these two DDSs. And then the output of that is, you can see one part comes back, that's the PLL part. The other one goes over here. There is a switch which can select either this path or this path. This path over here has two programmable dividers in a row, and this is clearly covering all of the low frequency parts. So you can divide this down by, I think there's two of them in a row, to, I think you can go to up to 64 or so. And that, that way you can cover all the way down to a seven mega or so, whatever the lowest frequency was. And the higher frequency part comes out of the switch, is amplified once again. And there's some interesting stuff happening here. Yes, there's another switch here. So there, there it is. This is the forward path without division. This is a divided path coming over here, meeting another switch. And this looks like it goes this way, but it doesn't actually. This is clearly for some option. If you don't have the 7 gigahertz option, there's this resistor here, which would then just directly connect this, and this entire section would be unpopulated. But this option here is required to get to 7 gigahertz. So that, that signal coming over here goes into here. There's a switch here once again. This is a doubler that allows the 4 gigahertz to basically reach almost 8 gigahertz, but they've capped it out at 7 gigahertz. Going over here, another selector switch, you can select several different paths, and these are all have filters on them, so that you can get rid of the harmonics as much as possible, or other, all the other modulation terms that show up. So doubling over here, selecting, 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 and then if you don't select it, you just go straight, that's for the lower frequency part. Going over here once again, digital attenuator, amplifier, digital attenuator, and then finally to the output. That's it, that's the entire synthesizer. Uh, quickly gone through. So it looks nice. Again, this is a very, very low phase noise. We just can't, can't get it to work right now. Now, looking at this, there are a lot of places this can fail. But I am fairly confident the problem is actually close to the connector. 
because we see all the frequencies. So therefore, all these paths are working, the switches are working, otherwise you wouldn't be able to cover all those frequency ranges. So the signal disconnect must be somewhere around here. So I'm going to go ahead and use the multimeter and measure and make sure these connections are actually there. There's, by the way, these little tiny coaxial components you see here, this is for uh, testing. You can, there's a special connector that plugs into this and gives you a really nice coaxial connector. I don't have that, unfortunately, but that's okay. We can still measure it. So let's go and do some measurement and see if there is a disconnect that we can find. Okay, let's do some measurement to make sure these connections are actually there. So we are in continuity test. That is working. So this signal over here has to be able to couple to this line, and this should be a zero ohm resistor because it's just the option selection switch. And yep, indeed that is zero. That works. And we should be able to have a connection here. Of course, I cannot measure through the solid state switches. That, that wouldn't work. But that is, that's fine. And there should be no connection from here to here. And there isn't. Now, there should be a connection from here to here. There is. And I, I cannot measure through this one. This last tiny component you hear is you see there is actually a capacitor. So maybe we can measure that capacitor separately. Let's go ahead onto the capacitor here. And I'm going to go across this, and we should see some reasonable value. What do we have here? Yeah, there you go, about 100 nanofarad. That sounds about right. So this capacitor is actually good. That's a great sign because I didn't have a capacitor that tiny right now in my tools. Let's go back over here. Let's go back to this connection. So that's working. So yeah, maybe the connection seemed to be OK. I'm going to go ahead and measure a few other things. Uh, let's see, the ground obviously is connected. Let's measure the SMA. If I can reach the SMA from the inside. There we go. And, oh, wait a second. Is this before the capacitor? Look at that. There's nothing from the SMA. There is no connection to the trace. There you go. How's that for intuition? Yeah, indeed, there is no connection unless I'm missing it because I'm behind the camera here. No, there isn't. You can see that I'm pushing really hard inside and there's nothing there. But if I come on the outside and I touch the trace, Yep, there's something there. So yeah, the connector is not there. Now, let me see if we can see anything. Oh, this is going to be a, a difficult thing to film. So it looks good on the inside of this connector. I don't see any, any issue with it. This is the one actually we should be looking at. Yeah, it looks you know, reasonable. But yeah, I, don't, I think the connection is not there. So maybe it's a little bit more obvious to you over the camera because you're seeing at a high resolution here. But I'm going to go ahead and remove this and, and see if I can find a replacement because I'm fairly sure that's the issue. All right, I managed to remove the connector, and the trace looks quite good, so I don't think this is going to be a problem. Now, of course, I don't have anything that looks like this, unfortunately, but I looked around my toolbox, and I do have something that's a little bit similar, slightly different footprint, and it looks like this. So it might need to be modified because this gap is too thin, and it wouldn't fit there. So they're fairly similar, and this pin is going to need to be cut. So it's not going to be perfect. Obviously, the way they've modeled and simulated this is going to be a little bit different from this connector, but you know, it's good enough for what we're trying to accomplish here to see if we can just fix this. All right, here's the new connector all soldered in. I think it looks pretty good, and I think it's making a, a nice connection. The ground should be okay. It's only a little bit different than the other one, and I think it should fit in the other case. So now the exciting part, putting it all back together. I almost forgot about the broken fan connector, but this was an easy repair. Just fix the traces, put some epoxy on it so that it doesn't come off. This thing is re not really under any torque anyway. I think it should be okay. Okay, the unit is put back together. It's connected back to the spectrum analyzer as well. Here's the software, 0 dBm, 1 gigahertz, and turn it on. And check it out, very nice. Uh, minus half a dBm, you know, there's some losses and so on. The connector is not exactly the same. But really, we have to go to the higher frequencies to make sure everything's good. Let's try 2 gigahertz here. There you go, 2 gigahertz, still good. <laughs> Power is a little bit higher, of course. And that has to do with just the you know, mismatches as well as the calibration of the instrument itself. And this is a fairly old unit, and now we opened it and closed it so many times. Uh, let's go all the way to 7 gigahertz. There you go, minus 0 0.86 dBm. I think it's pretty good. Um, the problem has indeed gone away. Now, a few other questions come up. You know, how accurate is this center frequency? And also, we should at least do one phase noise measurement with an ultra high performance phase noise analyzer to see if it kind of meets the specification. Okay, let's go ahead and measure the frequency accuracy of this. I'm going to compare it against the rubidium standard. There it is. Let's take a look. Uh, the instrument is turned off right now. I'm setting it to 1 gigahertz. Let's enable. And what do we see? Let it stabilize. Okay, 999.999 kilohertz. So it's okay, or, or megahertz, I should say. It is off. It doesn't have an OCXO. It is reasonably stable. I was expecting a little bit better than that. 
but we should also try and see what happens when we inject a 10 megahertz signal in if that entire kind of locking PLL at sub 100 megahertz works at all so for that I'm going to use somewhat of an unconventional source I'm going to use this Tektronix TSG4106A I've done a full teardown and review of this instrument as well and it has an exceptionally good built-in OCXO in fact I believe the original design was by Stanford Research and Tech has kind of reframed it and put a nice GUI in front of it. So I'm going to set that to 10 megahertz. I'm going to use that as a reference for this synthesizer and let's see what happens. I'm going to go back over here. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. Here we go. Here's our 10 megahertz reference. And let's see what happens. <laughs> Check it out. What did I tell you? It is a really, really nice clean source. And that instrument hasn't been calibrated in probably four or five years and it still works really, really well. So we can try higher frequencies. Let's try. 4 gigahertz or 3 gigahertz, doesn't really matter. 3 gigahertz, there you go. The error should be multiplied by 3, and indeed it is, because there's, this is a multiplier based, so therefore at higher frequencies your total offset from where you expect it will grow linearly. And uh, we can try 4 gigahertz, I think that's as high as the counter will go. There it is, there's 4 gigahertz. Looks really good. So um, yeah, I'm quite happy with that, it seems like everything is working. The only other thing to measure is just to do a quick phase noise measurement with a cross-correlator machine and see what it looks like. All right, let's go ahead and use the E5052B to measure the phase noise here. And in Roden Schwartz, if you're watching, I'd love to try out your phase noise analyzer as well to do some cross-correlation measurement in the same way. Let me zoom into the screen to see if this thing meets the spec. And check it out. And I, indeed, I think it does meet its specification. Look at how flat this is. Minus 140 dBc per hertz at 100 kilohertz offset. It's really good. And it goes all the way down here. This is cross correlation is enabled to minus 162 and a half. And this is not even that many cross correlation terms. We can go even lower. If you want to know exactly how this machine works and learn about phase noise, I have a video that goes into the details of how phase noise is measured, what it means, and how it works in a, in a real system, which I think also goes into the details of how this unit works. Yeah, so looks good. I would say this is fixed, and I'm fairly happy with this performance. Uh, but I do think that if you want to buy something like this, like the Noise XT, you better buy it with the OCXO, because I'm connecting it right now to the 10 megahertz reference in order to stabilize the really low frequency parts. But it looks good. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this um, repair. It wasn't a very difficult one, but at least we got to do a teardown and do reverse engineering of the architecture of this unit and really understand how it works. And as you can see, the performance is really good. And if you do happen to buy one of these, make sure you get the OCXO option. I think it does need that. And I'm sure the new PCBs have all the, you know, those issues all resolved. This is at least six years old as you see it. So I'm sure the new ones are better. And as always, thank you so much for my Patreon supporters. You make this possible. It's because of your generosity that I'm able to do this and bring this information to the general public you are giving to everybody not just to me as a result of this i'm very grateful there was a, a giveaway that i had announced a short while ago i'm going to announce the winner of that very soon so that's going to come up in a, in a video in the future in the meanwhile i'll see you in the comment section